Hey, everybody. Welcome to the No Film School podcast for the week of October 23rd, 2022. I'm Charles Hain. I'm a filmmaker. I'm here with filmmaker Gigi Hawkins. Hello. I'm here with cinematographer, filmmaker, and am I a filmmaker, Todd Blankenship. <laughs> hey, how's it going? And I'm here with editor-in-chief of No Film School and writer and producer, George Elliman. Hello. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about talent pipelines, the traditional uh, uh, development programs and the union that requires them. And the uh, and we're also going to be talking about uh, the new NBC Universal TikTok pipeline. Uh, we're going to be following that up with a discussion of run and gun filmmaking, a skill that we all could use more of. And uh, we're going to be wrapping it up with not one, but not two, but three pieces of just ridiculous tech news. I wish I could hold some of it in my hands, but we'll I'll do that next time. This week on the No Film School podcast. So our first topic this week, we're talking about talent development pipelines. So there's always been these very traditional pipelines. There are, you know, development um Grants that uh, grants is the wrong word, but like there's talent development programs which are DGA mandated. It is part of the DGA contract with the big studios that they have, like the NBC, and then the Disney one was always famous. I know people were always applying to the Disney diversity program, and they were designed to help people get a foot into the industry. So they were designed you would apply with a script, or you'd apply with a short, or you'd apply in some other fashion, and then it was a very structured pipeline process where you were trained on managing a writer's room, managing a set, all of those essential filmmaking skills. They've been around for a long time. They're very successful. A lot of people who make stuff you like came out of them. And then the WB, uh, which got bought by Discover, like there's some weird merger with Discovery Networks that we've all been talking about for two years now with uh, Discovery making some interesting choices of what to do with HBO Now or HBO Max or whatever it's called these days. And including like not least Catwoman, HBO yeah. then, <laughs> um, and uh, they just announced they were going to get rid of the Warner Brothers development programs, which got them all sorts of bad press. Because for fuck's sake, like don't get rid of your diversity programs. I don't like how much is that going to save you? A million dollars? Like who fucking cares about a million dollars when you're a multi billion dollar company? Like keep your program. And then like four days later. They were like, oh, actually, we can't cancel it because it's part of our DGA contract that we have it. And they, they put it back. <sighs> Can I just say, I, I haven't read this in any of the coverage, but they also canceled the the director's program last year. They Because I applied and uh, it's a process. It takes a lot of time and energy and effort to just apply to these programs because they're essays. I mean, it's think of it's like a college application. And they canceled it they just sent a letter saying hey we're not doing this this year after like after you'd all already done all that yes Man, yes that's just so wrong it was such a bummer but i well, think i would apply again for 23 because they're incentivized at this point to actually do it next all year <laughs> um yeah the thing that i didn't know until this all this coverage is that it's part of the dga contract that they have to have these programs and it it makes sense, and I'm glad that they're the guild is holding them to it. I mean, one of the things, if you talk to any of the unions, every one of the unions will say, we want a more diverse industry, and we want to create a pipeline. There's this perception of the unions as being really gatekeepy, where it's like, only people who already work get more work. But all of the unions, I think, are very smart about, like, the future of the industry should be diverse, and we should always be building the pipeline of the next generation, and we want to incentivize that. And I think this has always been one of the easier things for the unions to negotiate for, because when you're in negotiations for the contract, asking for everyone to get better pension benefits costs the studio a lot. Demanding a talent development pipeline is something that it's easy for the studio to give. And so it's like something that they've won in previous negotiations because it's something the union wants that the studio can do. So for the studio, it tells you a lot about the people currently taking over Warner Brothers HBO that they just thought that this was a line item they could just cut that they did not even realize that it was something that had been union negotiated and was not cuttable is a very, it tells you a lot about how much they understand about the business they are currently taking over and working with the other or, big developers. Or even care right now, about it. Like there's no, yeah. they don't care about it at all. It's just, well, and that there's no vetting process. Like usually if you're going to cut something, you're like, Hey everybody, can we cut this? And then some lawyer is like, Oh, actually no, we can't, but they just publicly, like it was, it made it to PR 
it made it to release without even and a lawyer even checking contracts. Um, then the bigger news this week, at least on my Twitter, has been that NBC Universal has announced a pipeline for TikTok creators to become showrunners. And there's been a lot of conversation about that. <laughs> there have been some yeah. hot takes. <laughs> What's funny about that one is I, a one take I liked was just um, that this is a we don't know what the fuck we're doing slash we never knew what the fuck we were doing. Because it's kind of like it just fits perfectly into the history of Vine. How can we how can we pull stuff from Vine and make that like profitable or or yeah. uh, or Quibi or or what's the thing the kids like? How do we what's the can really? we like it wasn't Quibi? I, I could tell you that it right. No, Quibi. I know, but like <laughs> the, the, there's this mentality that's just like. Um, is there a way we can figure out how to grab the value out of this and turn it into what we do? And everybody's just like, Ugh, you just always miss the point. Don't it's you, a, it's you being insane... like, so there's some monolith that thinks this way, but it's just this like weird gr desperation grasp at this is a popular thing. And, and it would be like, we got to get a piece of it. We got to, we got to transmogrify it into what we're doing here. It's like not really thoughtful, kind of like blunt and and careless and clueless, and it's not going to work out. And it's it's another way in which a lot of money, like you just mentioned something like a line item of a million dollars. That's just let's cross that thing off. It's a diversity program. We don't need that. But I bet you a lot of money every year gets sunk into really stupid harebrained things like this. That's just like let's make TikTok stars. Uh, TV showrunners. It's like, what? Why? And like, how much money is going to go down the drain on that? Like, that's just stupid. Yeah, it, it feels like... I'm going to argue the counter, but I want to hear Gigi first. <laughs> it feels like it's mirroring or attempting to mirror what Spotify has done with podcast talent. Because obviously, there we're seeing that it's the sort of like talk show style, big names that they're really investing in. And, and which is the opposite of television, like television show running is, is an incredibly complex, um, thing to be able to do, which is why having these type, types of like development programs is so critical and to, you know, it's just a different beast. And to think that somebody who can, you know, not, not to discount TikTok as, and especially people who are sort of putting out content on TikTok and, and treating it like a business and are, I'm sure are incredibly business savvy, but to carry an, a, a narrative over long form content and, and for seasons, like that's what a showrunner does. And that's something that it, it just feels like a true disconnect and a flashy name grab. Like I'm very, very curious of you know, what show is going to come out of that? And are you going to be accidentally sort of grabbing onto the next PewDiePie? And then you'll be like, oops, let me wash my hands of that. Moving on. Let's, you know, it's it, to me, it's just like, it's kind of this weird miscalculation where I, I just feel like people, the, the people doing this sort of thing, they don't understand what it is that people like about these TikTokers. And it's like saying, hey, all those things you like about this TikTok content, what if we took it out of that and did something totally different that you don't like as much? Like you referenced Vine, like when Vine died, all of the famous Vine people just started YouTube channels. They didn't go try to do TV stuff or whatever, like Drew Gooden, Danny Gonzalez, like Curtis Connor, all these people have like 14 million subscriber YouTube channels. They don't need to make a show. This is what they do. Like, I, 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 I want to, yeah, sorry. I don't want to cut you off. Keep going. No, I got, I, I got to, it, it's, it's, it's all kind of like in, in, in with the, the talent pipeline thing that we were talking about before, like it's all kind of in the same kind of issue zone, like uh, a lot without going into too many specifics that might get me in trouble. A whole lot of my corporate work um, that I've been doing to keep the lights on has been based around DEI. It's all been diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Like, I, And it's all, I'm telling you, every single one of them, it is a checking of the box. It's, it's, it has nothing to, like, 
it's always about money. You can tell it's always about the legal thing. It's always about all that sort of stuff. They, the, the pushback that you get when you like actually try to make a real point, like when you actually try to put something where it's like, hey, we should actually do the right thing. They, they kick it back and they're like, hey, cal- calm down now. Calm down. We can't say that. And I'm like, oh, I see what you're doing. I see what you're I just, doing. It's just, I really want to hear the counterpoint that Charles has, but I just want to point out or highlight with a highlight marker. One of the things, Todd, that you just said, which is that, uh, cause I, I, I think I, I'm curious to hear Charles counterpoint and I want to talk about that cause I have some counterpoint thoughts too, but the idea that you could take something that works one place and say, wait, wouldn't you like it if it was not that thing at all, but it was this thing. Like, it's like, if you take somebody from TikTok, I'm not saying this is what they're doing, but it's like, if you take someone who's good on TikTok and you're like, let's put them in a, in a, in a sitcom, in a three camera live sitcom. And you're like, but nobody likes that. Like, and that's not why TikTok's good, but that's like historically what's been done so many times where it's just like, this format's great. Let's um, digest it and turn it into poop. Like, yeah, I, like, okay. like me, the, the, one of the funnier here. things recently was um, when like Ninja did his master class. I don't know if y'all heard any of this, but like, yeah. you know, this, this famous uh, gaming uh, streamer and YouTuber, all that. He did a master class on like how to become a famous, famous Twitch streamer. Oh and gosh, it was like, my little an, brother would love that. But he it was an absolute that. joke. Like, he got memed so hard for it because it was just so like it he just didn't know how to function in that environment and it wasn't his environment it just didn't feel right like he just basically said like you know dye your hair blue um and just be funny on camera as much as you can like and then somehow they stretched that for like 12 hour course <laughs> so first off i love the expression got memed so hard that makes me really happy. <laughs> I'm going to start threatening people with that. You're going to get memed so hard over this one. Um, <laughs> I also just, just hearkening back to Quibi, I've been holding this in. I want to say that the most joy anyone got from Quibi was us on this podcast. <laughs> we had more fun making fun of Quibi than anyone had watching it. We it's did. like jazz. <laughs> um, but then, so here's my counter argument, and I'm going to get a little pretentious in this counter argument, and I'm going to talk go. about fucking Vladimir N- Nabokov. And I'm going to say that, like, you know, I really like the Script Notes Wait, podcast. I very much enjoy it. What? Who is that? Uh, Lolita, author of Lolita. Lolita. Oh, okay. And many Thank other. No, uh, how dare yeah. you not know that, Gigi? We all knew that. I totally <laughs> knew who that was. He's, he's, not, he's not a French New Wave filmmaker. You don't need to know him to be a filmmaker for everyone <laughs> I, listening I, at I home. I would argue like he's, that you, Nabokov is like... A, it's fascinating. It's, anyway, it's Russian literature. Novels. It's right. Russian it, emigre novelist. Uh, master of the short story, famous on the short story, then famous on the novel. And I think that there's a lot of other examples that, like, arguably famous in the short story and then turn to that fame into fame in the novel. And, like, there's another podcast I listen to, Script Notes, and I really like Craig Mason, and he's really great, but he has this thing where he's like, no one watches shorts, no one watches shorts. That's one of his themes. Like, writers will write in and be like, hey, how come no one watches shorts? And he'll be like, well, no one watches shorts. That's just a thing. And it's like, everyone watches shorts on TikTok. Like TikTok are short films. Like these are like we have these weird lines we draw between boundaries, and we're like, well, this is this, and this is that, and it's like because it wasn't shot on a soundstage, and it wasn't shot three camera, or wasn't shot. It's like, well, that's not a short film, and I'm like, I don't know. Like I see stuff on TikTok. I see stuff on TikTok that is not trying to be a narrative fiction short film, but I get sent TikTok. I'm not on TikTok because I'm too old to be on TikTok, but I get sent TikToks or see them on Twitter, and I'm like, oh, you're doing a short film. You're using this language where one person can play all the parts. You're using this language where the set doesn't matter. You're using these languages where it's a different language of short film that is developed on TikTok, but you're telling stories, you're using shots, you're using coverage, you're using tempo, you're using beats, there's story structure. These are short films. They just are short films. That's what they are. Some of them are really, really good. And some of these people are doing amazing work and I love it. And it's, I believe, I'll go with you on this. I believe in some ways it's the future of content. And I think in a lot of ways it's better. So that's part of where my sort of thing is like the don't, please don't try and turn it into some old legacy media that's not working as well. Let it, let their genius, it would be more interesting to me. Like if we said, Hey, let's, let's ask the good people doing the good TikToks, what we can learn as opposed to saying like, let's turn the people doing the good TikToks into us. Does that, does that make sense? But keep going. I mean, I don't know how the program's getting run. 
Yeah. But the idea of like, let's find 16 people with 10 million plus subscribers making short films and see if they couldn't do shows. If we get one good show out of that, I am more in favor of big companies having weird initiatives to try weird shit than I am only limiting us to the very traditional pipeline because the very traditional pipeline is, is very limited in how things get made. And the idea of like, okay, well, you guys have told stories enough to get 10 million followers. Let's see if one of them has a good show. Like if we can get one, like I think of the big YouTube TV shows as Girls and Broad City. Like those are the two shows. I know that Tiny Furniture was a movie, but like Lena Dunham had also done a lot of YouTube stuff. And I think of those two as the like people who found their voice on YouTube getting TV shows. And like those shows rock. Like they're both great. Broad City especially holds up. And it's like, all right, well, if we can get one Broad City out of this TikTok initiative, that's pretty cool. I'm excited I about that. It. And if 15 of them suck, like I, I'm more interested in getting to a media industry where a lot of failure is okay. And mm-hmm. we've been in a media industry where it's like, you get one shot kids. And it's like, I like the idea of like maybe 15 of these shows will be bad. And that's yeah. all right. No, I, I, I think that the point you're making that I, I can a hundred percent get behind. And I think we all can is that looking is have, is having the industry look elsewhere and, and take notes on where things are succeeding and try to farm some talent from various places is always a good thing. It's, I think the thing that to, to what you're pushing us to do, I think is be more is to differentiate a little bit or be more specific in the criticism. And I think that the criticism is more. Please, like I said, please don't ask people, don't force someone doing something interesting to do something stale because you're the powerful power broker. It would be great to allow them like Broad City to to expand in their voice. And I think it just depends on the company and it depends on the executives and it depends on the program, but it's a nuanced point. And it's very easy for us to just be like, this is dumb because we consider gatekeeping dumb. And I think you're right. That's not totally fair. It's better for the, to to acknowledge that there's nuance and like just looking for people doing interesting stuff. Like TikTok is TikTok is like sur- channel surfing back in the day. Like some of us may be too young to have done that out there in the world, but like some of us remember TikTok is channel surfing on speed, steroids, coke, and all this other stuff. It's just like ah, like it's like not. It's like ch- it's like cook it to my veins. Like it never stops. The stories are quick. Like, and there's no infomercials, <laughs> but like it, uh, it's incredible. And I think that it, it, for that reason is got so much legs to how we're going to consume stories in media, but I'm not the guy or person who's going to crack how it fits into some of the leg- legacy media boxes. I just think they're trying to figure that out and it's probably going to be a clunky fit. That's my take. I yeah. Like I mean, I, I oh, go, go ahead. I like the celebration of short films uh, and sort of like acknowledging the work that goes into like, even though, even if it is on TikTok or built for, you know, vertical video. um, Yeah. Cause I, I mean, I also love script notes, script notes. And I think I really respect Craig Mazin and, but I'm like, I like shorts have an audience, even if it's just me. You know what? You know what I think he's prob they're probably saying is that nobody watches shorts like gatekeepers don't watch shorts because I know from like just no film school world that like a lot of people love watching shorts. Like when we've posted stories in the history of no film school of like, here's like a hundred really scary shorts you can watch right now. Those are some of the most popular posts ever because there's a lot of people who like watching shorts. Like they might not be the agents and managers, even though I'd actually push back on that too, because I yeah. I got a manager out of a shorts fest once. So I know, I know they're out there watching shorts, but probably not in the way that maybe he's just trying to dissuade people from that path because I don't know, like he, he probably knows what he's talking about. Well, I, think <laughs> the saying, but- making, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Craig Mason. Chernobyl's great. I also think his writing on the hangover movies is good. Every once in a while, someone makes fun of the hangover movies and I'm like, no, those are fucking really well written and very well. Hangover movie and is a great script movies. and a great idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, But I think the argument he's making, and the argument he's making is a correct argument, is when platforms like Netflix and HBO have tried to, like every couple of years, Netflix will buy a bunch of shorts at Sundance, and then they don't end up doing any traffic on Netflix. And then the next year, you know, one year they'll buy a bunch of shorts at 50 grand each, and then the next year they don't buy anything. And what they're talking about is that within the traditional pipelines, when I go to Netflix, I'm looking for a two-hour movie or a 12-episode show, like 
what people are looking for is very dictated by where they go to look for it. And the same way, if you opened up a TikTok and it was like 12 hours, you wouldn't watch it. When you go to Netflix and you're like seven minutes, it's like Netflix uses shorts to win Oscars. They won one with two distant strangers. Like, um, but like they don't use it necessarily. Like it, things need to fit in the, we walk into a platform with expectations and the things that succeed on those platforms fit within our expectations of what that platform delivers. And right now we don't have a successful shorts platform that works outside of things like TikTok. And the reason those, you know, the, the struggle we have is, you know, um, if we're going to put a lot of resources into something, we need a lot of hours of attention to financially justify the resources we put into it. So the successful short platforms are shorts where like the average budget is $58 in tacos, which is like the average budget of a TikTok where it's like, oh, we're just like hanging out in the apartment we already have and we order food for everybody. So it's like, it's, it's just thinking about things in different spaces. I always, I always like to remember also that like there's this idea that we're always about to reinvent the wheel. Um, like every time someone posts about like, man, nonlinear storytelling is going to be this thing that we invent in the future that's going to work in VR. And Katie Henson from Blue Collar Post Collective always chimes in and is like, video games exist. And like, I love every time she does that because she's like, no, we've already, nonlinear storytelling has already been cracked in video games. It works. Million, it's a bigger industry than film. Like, we do not need. We do not need to reinvent that. That exists. Like VR is not going to be Mark Zuckerberg's Horizons. VR is going to be World of Warcraft, which already has millions of users putting on helmets to play World of Warcraft, which already works in that space. Like it's going to be a thing that already is there growing into it. And it's like, we already have short, we have short platforms where people love watching short content and they go to it for that. And that will grow into other things. I think Craig is right that like, if you're hoping for a, I get to make a hundred thousand dollar five minute short once a year business. That's not going to be a business model. There's no way to monetize your hundred thousand dollar short. <laughs> yes, that is a hobby, um, a very expensive hobby. That's like a fencing very. level expensive hobby. Um, but and so I think Craig is right. I just think that like neglecting TikTok being shorts is a big deal. And I think the same way short story writers turn into novelists. I think there will there is a there's a genius level auteur who is currently nineteen and on TikTok. Like I, I firmly, deeply in my soul believe that that is true. Now, speaking of TikTok and production values, let's pivot to our second topic today: run and gun. Gigi, kick us off. Run and gun. Oh production. my gosh! Wait, before we get there, Todd, did you have a thought that I cut you off on earlier? Um. Well, I was just gonna, like uh, to to the everything that we've been talking about. Um. It's just definitely like it's something that I I think about all the time right now. Is that Everything is changing in a really big way. And you you brought up VR, you brought up TikTok, like all these different things. And like, I think there's just so much content being created that is not part of the traditional pipeline that I think when we talk about people like Warner Brothers coming to TikTokers, it's, it's, it's very understated that they don't need Warner Brothers. Like they don't need it. It's not. And, and that's the thing is like Twitch streamers don't need money from Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers needs money from the TikTokers. They want to usurp as much as they can of the content that they're creating. And and like you they said need like the audience. That's what they're really after. Yeah, but because if you, I mean audience. if you think about like television, like cable television, the numbers that cable television is doing is hilariously bad. It's really, 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 really bad. And the that sort of thing is is a result of the fact that when you go on to watch something on your TV or whatever, you just you don't go on the the cable app. You go on YouTube. You go on whatever. You go on Twitch. You go on other other platforms. You're not using that those those old methods of watching content, and that's going to keep going. Like that's going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. There's so many different ways to make content. Like I I personally have gotten relatively obsessed with VR stuff because I put one on uh, during the pandemic because I was like losing my mind and I had to like go in VR and stand on top of a mountain to like clear my head. And <laughs> I want to know more about this. Okay. <laughs> I, I was, my mind is blown by the potential of VR stuff. It, to me, it is, will eventually be the perfect entertainment medium. It'll be better than anything eventually like give it another five years you'll be able to put on a vr headset and be like holy shit this feels like i'm here and i i don't know it's just like to me like everything is changing like you can pull out your phone and scan a photo real 3d model of a damn thing like 
it, it's all tied together. And it's just like content is going to be this weird like cloud of a hundred different sources at, at in some point soon. Anyways. That's my that's I mean, my weird like take on all this is like I I I feel very strangely about the future of film. I feel very strangely about the future of like traditional storytelling with a camera. I think it's going to change and I think we got to be ready for it. That's my take on it. I'm going to try a, pi- a pivot, a transition here. Um if ever you're feeling overwhelmed by the change, grab a camera and run and gun. Uh, I tried. Nailed Um, it. Yes. (laughs) Thank you. Um, Well, yeah, I wanted to talk about this because I came off of like a three hour shoot with some friends Sunday night, like shooting on two phone cameras. Um, But we completely storyboarded the whole thing. It was uh, Jim Garrett was directing and he wanted to like try a sort of like Halloween horror thing. And he found this amazing parking garage in the basement of uh, Rayleigh's, I want to say. And and it was a, just a grand old time. We did accidentally, we had a sort of, it was called Devil Head and we had a man in costume and we did scare somebody by accident. And so like, you know, moral ambiguity around this, but also just the high of of getting the shot and like, are we gonna get kicked out? There's this like sort of really fun, visceral uh playfulness that comes with that type of shooting and i wanted to hear some some war stories from you guys and like tips and and yeah i'd love to hear everyone's thoughts man um that there's a there's a i'm i'm kind of sitting in the house that run and gun filmmaking built honestly like I, it's it's almost all i've done <laughs> so i definitely have quite a few war stories and definitely definitely quite a few thoughts it's it, i'm currently in a place of like kind of a love hate relationship with it cuz i'm getting kind of tired of doing it but it is sort of like it's fun it is fun when it when it when it's fun it's fun um when you're not trying to get kicked out of places and all that sort of stuff um but i mean i don't know it's it's uh nowadays with cameras having such good like internal stabilization and um, you know, autofocus and stuff. It's, it's easier to do than ever for sure. Like you can get really cinematic stuff just, just with a, with like a camera that's like under $2,000 running gunning. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot lot to it. I have a lot of strong feelings because, uh, definitely was like one of the ways I cut my teeth and one of the things I did the most of, but also as a person who's often been a producer it's like a super, super stressful and unpleasant, you know, and, and when you're a producer, you're always the one who has to kind of pick up the pieces when it doesn't go right. Like, and, and you're also the bad guy who has to be like, this is a really bad idea if it doesn't work. And you kind of don't want, and it, and it kind of casts you in a, so, so I have definitely a love hate. Um, I think the ultimate example to me of run and gun uh that i was kind of bore witness to even though i wasn't involved in it was this thing called ikea heights that these people all these people i knew did back in like 2009 and i i know all uh, there's a lot of comics i worked with a lot of them at the time and since but (laughs) <laughs> they just went into Ikea and shot like a Melrose place ish <laughs> thing in an Ikea with people there. And oh they kind of set up and shot their scenes and stuff was going on around and they would get interact. They would a- end up interacting with the, um, you know, the store, the other people like interrupting whatever they were trying to do, but they, they were using like living room sets and stuff that were built <laughs> in the Ikea as like That's the showroom so floor. So it was, it was a brilliant thing. And, and it's a fascinating little, like, and it, and it kind of popped off for a little bit. Yeah, like in, I, I, I really feel like I've seen this. Like, as you've been describing it, it feels like a distant memory that's, like, kind of reforming in my head that I might have. Did, was it online? Randall Park places? was in it, right? Yeah, Randall Park, who was in my movie, too, was, like, the main guy. And and uh, the the writers and the have all, like, moved on. Like, a lot of them have been writing other big stuff. But it was around. It was, it was, it was, it was probably semi-viral. It was, like, 2009. This was a while ago. Well, and there was that but, famous um, movie that shot at Disneyland without Disney's permission. Right. Oh, yes. Yeah. And they uh, shot the entire Tangerine? feature at Disney. 
No, no. Um, I thought it was no, no, no. It wasn't Kingdom. Tangerine. Tangerine was yeah, iPhone yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, yes. But Tangerine, Tangerine was, was also, able yes. to shut down its release; like it never really came out. Um, yes, so I remember that. Let me try and make the other one. I was going to bring up. Gun. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I was going to say. Another good example, though, is Justin Chan, who I've interviewed a couple times for No Film School. Oh, yeah. He did, he's done a couple movies. Uh, he's a friend of No Film Schools. He, I remember doing an interview with him about one of his movies that was at Sundance called Miss Purple. And he was just talking about them just like run and gun in the streets of LA. And I was just like, your producers must hate you. <laughs> like, like they were taking all these chances and like running around. And stealing shots in the middle of the street. And it was like, it's in the finished movie. And he was like, yeah, man, like, you got to do what you got to do sometimes. So, I mean, it can work. You can also get burned. Like, you can get burned. And I don't want to go. I I might save the stories I have. But, like, one of the things I think I learned that I'm really good at um, is, like, you got to be able to tap dance, like, and, like, delay and like apologize, apologize, apologize. Cause it's like that it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission, which is not a rule that I think people should live by, but like that you just end up in those positions where you're like, Oh my God, I'm so dumb. I'm sorry. I fucked up. And meanwhile, they're finishing up somewhere else, you know, like, but it's yeah. Charles, do you have anything valuable to say about well, no, it? I, mean, I don't I think I gave like, anything of off, value. You should be careful. So I, have stolen a lot of locations. There's one location in LA that I stole so often that the second time I got arrested stealing it, oh. when I was in handcuffs on top of the cop car, the cop always does a thing where they're like, when I run your record, what am I going to see? Um, and I was like, you're going to see the last time I got arrested here, which is like not a great thing to tell a cop. Um, but then we ended I up talking about they just got a new arrested for running and gunning. That's twice that's in the same location. Um, record so i i'm not going to encourage running gunning but i'm going to say if you do run and gun the biggest lesson i can take away is please plan ahead to be thorough and fast so like i once worked on a show where the production was super together i was just the camera operator but like literally they were like oh we're going to shoot this scene on ventura boulevard on saturday night and i was like we're never going to get away with it but like we prepped we planned everything happened at, at our main location we showed up we had two 4Ks up within 15 minutes. We shot for half an hour. We were back in the van and out within an hour. We lit a scene with a generator and 4Ks on Ventura Boulevard, but we were in and out in an hour and we were fine. And then I had an El Matador in LA. I worked on a feature that like we shot El Matador and like you're over a cliff and we were over the cliff in five minutes. And then I did a commercial. We were over the cliff in five minutes. And I like, then I worked on another El Matador job, is a beach, by the way. Which is at the bottom of a cliff. Up. So like yeah. you park at the top it's of the beautiful. cliff and you hike and no one can see you. And then the third job I did it, production just didn't have their act together. And we got there and the trucks parked. And I was like, why did we bring the trucks? Because you don't want to bring the trucks because cops know what production trucks look like. You try and bring cars. And then they set up a makeup table up at the top. And then they set up all this. And I was like, and I literally, I said to the producer, I was like, guys, we're stealing this location. Like, what are you doing? And they're like, well, we got to do makeup. And then like within five minutes, the cops were there and we had to drive to Ventura and shoot the scene. And And it was one of those things where I was like, if you're going to steal a location, you can't set up a makeup table where the cops can see you. You can't like, you have to like, you have to think of how to be sneaky. Um, so that, that I agree. That's great advice. It would tie into my other thing as a producer who's like had to try to talk, like I said, through some run and guns, even when you do have permits. And I used to be a stickler because I would be like, I don't want to have to get shut down if we're really doing this. Like, so I'm going to do everything by the book. Um, even then people will come after you sometimes. Cause there will be a neighbor who's just like, what are you doing? And why am I not getting some of the money? And if you have enough money for all this stuff, cause people around here in LA, they're savvy. So you got to be careful if you're in a major city, like that's, that's my thing. That's why when he told me it was LA, I was like, that's crazy. Like trying to do it in LA, trying to do it other places, people might kind of like it sometimes. You never know. Yeah. You can lie to them. And like, but like in the instant, and I don't advocate lying, but even when you have crossed your T's and dotted your I's, people will ask to see forms and they'll be a problem. So if you haven't, you kind of have to delay. And my, my advice is to, and I, it seems obvious, but so many people, especially in the industry, are so used to pretending to be a big shot that they don't think this way. 
admit you're wrong, ask for forgiveness, say you're stupid and you screwed up and you're just trying to do this and you didn't know the rules. And if you can check your ego and actually just be like, instead of trying to be like, I have the right to do whatever I want, which is everybody seems to always walk into everything with this stupid mindset that they're like, they know what they're doing and they're right. Like if, if you just approach things from the standpoint of like, yes, look, first time, low budget, this is a mistake. Would you mind if you let us finish? Like people sometimes will be nice about that. But if you approach it from the like, you're aggressive and you're a big shot, like, no, nobody's going to, nobody's going to like you. Nobody's going to want to help you. And it seems obvious, but you'd be amazed how many people can't follow that simple advice of just like try to be humble and try to fall on your sword. Sometimes mm -hmm. it, it like, it'll work wonders for you in life in general. But I definitely think in a situation where you're doing something obviously wrong that you're not supposed to be doing, but I would always advocate for trying to do it the right way because I just think, um, the cons outweigh the pros. That's my opinion. There was a interesting situation that happened a couple years ago when I was doing a test shoot to uh, shoot on a road, like a driving scene where we wanted to test out mounting the camera and see how it cut together. And we had permits and we were shutting down the road with the police. Like we were doing it all by the book, but we wanted to like test it out before. So we came up like two weeks before uh, up in like Socrates, New York, and it was freezing out. And it was just me, my producer, and my DP, uh, and a dog, uh, strapping this camera to the car and driving it back and forth. And this, this guy, um, got so aggressive towards us in a way that was like really jarring. And I, what kicked into gear for me was my old customer service days where it was like, I'm so sorry. Oh my gosh. Like, other people have been shooting up here and it's been frustrating for you. That is really shitty. And sometimes people just want to like yell and, and get angry and get in that fight. And then when you stop and empathize with them, like it's disarming. And this guy was like very, a very, very angry, probably MAGA type. Like, I don't want to say <laughs> type, but like, it was, scary. I was like, does this guy have a gun? But all I did, all I could do was like stand there and be like, I'm so sorry that happened. That is so frustrating. Like, what can we do? Like, we've been, this is what we've done, but like, how can we make it better right now and in the future, blah, blah, blah. And I think he was just like shocked that I was like standing there listening to him and empathizing. So um, I second, like in, in any, I think especially like in, in filmmaking, because it's so in any situation, like people who are on your team coming in and being frustrated, being a leader is being able to like empathize with people. Uh, yeah. You don't want to meet steel with steel, basically. Yeah. Like that's just, especially if you're wrong. <laughs> Todd, did you have anything else? Because you probably have run and gun a ton, right? You're in a house that run and gun. <laughs> yeah. Big uh, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's definitely like, I think the, the main thing that comes to mind is there was a, a day that I, I landed in LAX at like uh, 7 a.m. one day. I had a flight out at 2 a.m. that night or whatever, or that next morning. And I shot probably 20 different places on that day. And it was just like they had a bunch of weird little pickup. And like like we had like a skydiver. I was up in a helicopter at one point, And then I was on the Santa oh. Monica Pier. And uh, I was walking to a little too close to the water and I had a black magic six K with an Atlas Orion anamorphic and I was getting a really cool shot and the, the tide came in a little bit stronger at one point and I got water up to about my waist and I was holding the camera up above my head Ooh. and the, um, you know, we were in a parking garage and um, it was like a really cool sort of floor of it that was all grungy and, and beaten up and stuff. And we were about to start shooting this one scene in there and like a really kind of scary guy came up and he was like, you have to go. This is not a place you want to be at this time of night. <laughs> it was like that whole kind of deal. So it's just like, you know, I've, I've definitely, uh, I've, I've run and gunned a, a ton, but you know, it's funny thinking about the differences between doing it in LA versus Dallas, which is where I live are very different. Like, um, in Dallas, it's mostly just people being like, Hey, what are you doing? And you know, you just make up a, <laughs> like I'm shooting a mayonnaise commercial or whatever. 
and um, you know, but it's 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 really rare that you get kicked out of a place here. But it's funny, yeah, thinking about how savvy people in LA or New York are about that sort of thing. Um, I've noticed they want, they're, they, they're either yeah, really they're going to squeeze you. <laughs> they're, they're either really cool about it because they're used to it, or they're really not cool about it. Um, it's one of the two that I've experienced so far. Well, it's a, but. it's a shakedown opportunity. So one of the first producers I worked for in LA said, every location you need an envelope full of lawnmower money. Because if you're shooting, somebody's going to run their lawnmower to try and get paid off. So you should just have like five Benjamins in an envelope. So you can just walk over and hand them $100 so they'll stop mowing their lawn because they're only mowing the lawn because they know you're rolling sound. And so I'll tell you whole, one thing. From experience, if you ask them nicely, that doesn't work. <laughs> hey, we're trying yeah. to shoot a movie over here. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, and then there's I a great also... book, Verbal Judo. I think everybody should read Verbal Judo. It's about dealing with people when they are angry. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting. It has a lot of like counterintuitive stuff, most of which like Gigi is already doing naturally. But like in terms of like just – like, let your ego go. You do not need to win the argument. Let them exhaust their anger past you, which is why they call it verbal judo. Like, let them, let them, let it go past you with the thing, but you don't need to attack back. And uh, it, it's verbal judo, fascinating book for this stuff. It's, it's just the thing is that when you're shooting, it attracts attention. So the number one thing, like the number one thing is the low profile, like Charles said. Like if like, even though he did that one with the four Ks and they got out quickly, like if you got to go quick, go quick, but like the low profile thing. And like, if you're in trouble, you say you're a student, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, unless that, you can't yeah. pass it off, unless you're like old enough looking like me that you can't get away with that anymore. <laughs> but if you can say you're a student, it, it, I have two that's 56 gonna... year old grad students. I, I give yeah, all so... of you permission to say you're a student, 72, <laughs> 12, you're a student. All of you are our students of this podcast, so you're not even lying. Yeah, yeah you're a no film school student. Yeah, great idea. Yeah, so it, 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 we'll get the cease and desist. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, we're going to wrap this up with not one, not two, but three pieces of tech news. And I'm going to go from like the weirdest and most obscure to the thing that's probably relevant to everybody. So the first thing we got to talk about is Fuji has dropped a new box lens. And nobody, nobody is thinking, I should care about that, because box, lens, box lenses are what you see. If you watch football games and you ever see, like, cameras on the sidelines, they have a box lens on. We call it a box lens because it's square. They have these really long zoom ranges, which is how you get those amazing shots on the football field. So Fuji dropped a new box lens, but it is for filmmakers. So it's got a PL mount, not the B4 mount. It covers Super 35, not the smaller two-thirds inch chip of broadcast. They specifically designed it so the bokeh, the out-of-focus area, would look like film. It works with film follow-focus. So it works with the Aerie follow-focus and the Preston follow-focus, and others are going to come. And, like, it's twofold. It's like, first off, they're starting to shoot sports games on cinema cameras. Like, you'll see a Sony Venice or, like, other fancy cinema cameras at the bigger football events and live concerts. But also, sometimes when you're making movies, you want a really, 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 really long zoom. And the one they launched is a 40x zoom. It zooms from a 25 millimeter wide, which is pretty wide, all the way to a thousand millimeters long. And a thousand millimeters is like the lens they used in Lawrence of Arabia to shoot like riders on the horizon with waves of heat was a thousand millimeter Panavision custom made. And, and now there's That's like exciting. a rental with a zoom. It's, it looks very nice. And Fuji and. A thousand millimeter lens, when you work with them, you mount to the lens because they're so heavy and you're always like fighting vibration. Like if there's a concert going on and there's vibration dampening built in, which like, it's just like they did everything. So it's cool. The second piece of tech is also from Fuji. It's the first cam, the X2S, which is XH2S, which just came out, is the first camera that's going to have built in camera to cloud, which means the camera can just shoot your files straight to the cloud for frame IO for editing. Like you just plug in an Ethernet cable and and as you shoot, your cameras just go to the cloud. You don't need like an external Terra deck. You do need to use like the Ethernet adapter, but it's like it's the first of what I think will be many. I think in five years, every camera will have this built in, but this wow. is the first one. And then the last thing, which we can talk about a little more because we've got a minute. iPad just launched a new iPad Pro built around the M2. 
And I don't know if Todd has seen this yet, but there's DaVinci Resolve for iPad was in the announcement. Ooh. So we are looking at Resolve for iPad coming out soon. It was not officially in the announcement, but one of the screenshots had Resolve for iPad in the thing. So we're about to see what it looks like to have Resolve on your iPad. Are Todd, there, I love your face. I are love there your face. Editing softwares on iPads, like. Or so there's a or, few. Um, I haven't used any of them. Premiere has I a movie? software called, <laughs> from, called it iMovie for iPad. There is. There's iMovie for iPad. Premiere has an app count. called Premiere Clip. And Premiere Clip was made for iPad. And the marketing approach they always made with Premiere Clip is like, you're a social media creator. You want to shoot on set. You want to edit when you're on your way home. And you want to get back to the studio. Move it over to full Premiere. Do your finishing and upload. And I, I have a sneaking suspicion Resolve is going to be making the same argument where like, you want to be organizing your footage on your iPad on the train trip home. You want to get to the office, bump up to the full Resolve to do your edit is, I think, what their take is going to be. But Resolve has just done a whole bunch of new cloud and, and storage features that make me think that this is going to be like, oh, I'm working in the office all day. And then on my way home, I get a note and I can just open it up and tweak the note. I think they're going for it. I think they're going to try and do the thing. So Todd, no you look so suspicious. So work life balance anymore. That, yeah, that no, was my no first ability thought, to ever be free of a client. That just like, like all I, I mean, camera to cloud is neat and everything, but like, f- f- uh, I'm I've I've always been like kind of resistant to all the frame IO stuff because I'm just like, that's just so many different people giving me feedback all the time, and then now, <laughs> now I've got a, I, I got to get feedback while I'm actively shooting. Like, hey, hey, shoot that better, you know? <laughs> hey, you're not shooting good. <laughs> oh, man. You know? And then, oh, I did man. a camera That's a... to cloud job in January, and we were camera clouding, and stuff was appearing in Frame.io, and, like, clients were having notes. Ooh, that looks too dark in the background. Can we put another? And, like, a client on the other side of the country, 5,000 miles away, was like, can we turn that sign in the background for the next take? And it's like, wow. But this is where we're going, Todd. They, they, what's the, whatever that Jurassic Park line is, um, they didn't ask if they, they should, they just asked if they could or whatever it is. That's what this is to yeah. me. I'm just like, uh, yeah, I don't want to get noted on set unless it's, I mean, if there's a client in the room, cool, but like, I don't, yeah. Uh, anyways, I think that's interesting. I don't really know with the resolve thing, um, is that going to be somehow usable with, I just like can't wrap my head around, I guess, the cloud workflow for that. Do, is there enough storage on these things to hold proxies? No, it's going to be live. Like what they're going to do is because they have that new live compression tool that will automatically generate proxies when you plug in your hard drive. My guess is that they're going to auto generate proxies in the Dropbox. And then those proxies are going to stream to the iPad if you work on your iPad is my guess. That's That's what I'm assuming their plan is. Which, if it works, could work well. I can see it working. I'm optimistic. I What I want to avoid is I want to avoid ever having to go back into the office after I've left. We've all done that thing where we get home and then there's like one motherfucking thing you've got to tweak in something, but everything's in the office. And the ability to be like, okay, I can open the same project I had open there on the iPad. I can make the little tweak I can do in the iPad and I can click render and it can export. Or managing renders. I mean, you know, if I have a big render going of like, I've got nine versions of a feature, the ability to open that up and resolve from iPad and see how my remote render is going, those things seem interesting to me. Have you ever used Parsec? Ooh, what's Parsec? Ooh, Charles. Yes, I know I know the woman who created Parsec. Do you really? Yes. That's amazing. Uh, well, hey, I use it. Parsec is how fast the Millennium Falcon... Got through to the Kessel Run. <laughs> That's Parsec. Wait, parsec. parsec. I know Parsec. 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 Are we talking about the same Parsec? The ad, the ad? Desktop software? Okay, so it's... Uh, Gigi, you can tell me if it's the same thing, we're, we're, if we're talking about the same thing. So it's a thing where you can remote really, really, really quickly into other desktops. And so you can do it, what you're talking about, Charles, with Parsec. And I think you can actually also do it with iPad as well. But, or maybe not, I don't know. But yeah, you, you just set like, so I have a lot, you know, I have my laptop and this, this beef, beefier machine. And I just go to a coffee shop and I work on my beefier machine from the laptop and it's completely seamless. And it's, it's better than any other remote desktop. Like gamers use it to game like 
on, you know, so obviously it's really, really fast. Is that the thing you're talking about, Gigi? Different parsec. Oh, darn. Different parsec. It is the Star Wars thing, though. <laughs> I was going to say different parsec. They made, they made I, mean, the I, say, I think parsecs existed before Star Wars. Just saying. <laughs> um, I don't know that no. we would have called that the Star Wars thing. I, I don't I, know. Th- I've used there's... Apple Remote Desktop for 15 years. Apple Remote Desktop is fine. But if there's a good remote desktop that gamers are using that has no lag, Parsec. Four pieces of tech news, guys. Parsec, Parsec. already existed, but it's news to this guy. <laughs> Can I just throw out, because we were talking about this and we're talking about notes, and, I, and I've worked, I've been so fortunate to work with Todd and Charles when they were doing videos and there was no process. But like, I feel like for everybody out there to understand that like, just because there's an opportunity to give notes doesn't mean you should. Like that, like kind of to to piggyback on the, if just because you could, they could like, I've like, sometimes just let one person do it or, or just sit back and let the notes, let, let the, let the note process have, like, not everybody needs to have notes. Not, not every thought you have needs to be a note. Not every opinion you have matters or should help. And sometimes there's, there's, it's the classic, like too many cooks in the kitchen. Everybody knows that one, but it's just like, like we've talked a couple of times tonight or today, this morning checking egos has come up, but it's just like, you know, maybe you don't know. Maybe you don't, maybe your ideas aren't that good. Maybe, you know, maybe let someone else just have the wheel. Let one person drive. Like, I I just think so much, like so many times clients, especially if, if it's for a product and maybe you've got some clients who aren't used to in the industry and they're having fun with it. It's like, I think we could all benefit from just kind of pulling back a little and let the process happen, you know? Let it take care of itself. It's it's a culture thing that has happened a lot in this industry about everyone keeps saying collaboration is super important. And and what they mean is everyone can give notes. And and I I just I, I mean I, fine. I I'll put up with it, but I completely <laughs> agree. I think cuz really what what hap, what keeps happening to me is that I'll go through rounds on frame IO with certain stakeholders. I'll make all these changes with certain stakeholders. And then they send it to the real people who really have the stake. And then I have to do their stakeholder changes. And it's, it's just, it keeps on going. Just that is the industry all over the place. That's a microcosm. And I, and I just think like, it's like what I'm trying, what I'm trying to impress upon people is that like, you might have good ideas. Everyone can give notes. You're right. Everyone's capable, very capable. Like everyone has two things, right? An opinion and, and the other thing. But like, don't, you just don't have to, you don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> like, and you might make it more complicated if you do. You might make it worse, you know? I also got the best piece of advice I ever got, which is get to a group call as early as you can because mm. a group call shows you power. Because I used to be like, oh, I don't want to, I hate conference calls. And somebody was like, no, get on a group video call as soon as you can. Because you will, and watch for who, when they talk, everybody else, it, it like finishes the conversation. Because yeah. when you're going back and forth with a junior person who's trying to guess what the senior person is going to like, mm. you can waste weeks trying to guess. And then they finally show it to the senior person who doesn't like it. And you waste all this time. And, and like, but the sooner you can get everybody on a group call, you can be like, oh, the person I actually need to see is Gigi. Like George, George opinions don't matter on this job. And like, and then when George gives you notes, you can be like, oh, hey, well, let's show it to Gigi and see what Gigi thinks. Right. Yeah. And, and, like, and can... as the George, like, I just have learned, like, just don't give notes. <laughs> like, it doesn't, like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, just don't waste everybody's time unless you're asked to, you know? That's, there's also uh, in the workflow process as the sort of creative lead, it's really important to define the the rounds of notes and like otherwise there's the just an a scope creep that can just make the workload explode in an unmanageable way and yeah i've i've seen it happen both ways (laughs) it's an epidemic all right (laughs) notes people need to be talking about this right I think that's a great place to wrap it up for this week. So I'm Charles Hain. I'm on the internet at Charles Hain. I'm on YouTube at Charles Hain. And I write on film school and stuff. I'm Gigi Hawkins. And I'm on the internet at Lost in Graceland and at ggihawkins.com. I'm Todd Blankenship. And you can find me on Instagram and YouTube at Am I a Filmmaker? 
I'm George Gentleman, editor in chief at No Film School, and you can find everything we talked about today and more at nofilmschool.com. Please like, rate, and subscribe to the podcast and the YouTube channel where you're watching this. Um, be sure to send us your questions. We love hearing from you. Editor at nofilmschool.com. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, everything else. Thanks so much for watching slash listening. Have a good day. Mm-hmm.